Well, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the second Erasmus lecture on the history and civilization of the Netherlands and Flanders. Uh, we heard the first one of these last week. Uh, the third and last one will be a week from now. Uh, my name is Frans Papen. I uh, chair the committee that uh, nominates the Erasmus Lecture. Um, for those who weren't here, I just want to explain that the lectureship was established, goes way back to 1967 when it was set up with uh, uh, private and corporate uh, Dutch money, and then it was supplemented in 1994 with a donation from the government of Flanders. So it covers the entire Dutch-speaking region uh, in Europe. So when I talk to people, or we talk to people about the history and civilization of the Netherlands and Flanders, the first thing that comes to mind often is that region's prominence, historical prominence, in things such as painting, drawing, printmaking, and so on. And so certainly this museum and the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, the, um, the uh, P.O.D. Essex Museum, so Boston certainly is one of the exponents of this. And so over the years, we have had many lectures in, 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 several, in, in many, uh, many fields, but it's no surprise that many of them have been, uh, of the, we have had several art historians. And this term, we're very fortunate to have one of the most prominent among them uh, with us, Professor Erik Jan Sluiter of the University of Amsterdam. And then I'll call on the, the chairman of the Department of uh, the History of Art and Architecture, Professor Kerner, to do the introduction. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to introduce Eric Jan Slauter for this, the second of his Erasmus lectures in the history and civilization of ne the Netherlands and Flanders. I'm especially happy to do this as a representative of my department, the Department of History of Art and Architecture, where Pro Professor Slauter is currently giving a course titled Making Art in Amsterdam, circa 1645 through 1675, from Rembrandt and his competitors to the lower tiers of the art market. I worried a little that the phrase lower tiers, as well as those highly specific dates, would scare the students away, but I was wrong to worry because they came to the course in droves. My department, I would add, has a long history of teaching in the field of Dutch art. I cannot count the number of people I've met over the years who reported having been changed deeply by learning about Dutch art in classes taught by Seymour Slive in a space pretty uh, neighboring to this one. I'm sure some of you are here today. Slive ignited a lifelong passion for art and for art's history due to his marvelous eye, his melodious voice, and his own sympathetic character. But as he would have said if he were with us today, he had a lot to work with. Because of all the old masters, the Dutch painters were perhaps the first to speak consistently across to you, not from the spiritual heights of religion or from the social heights of noble or patrician self-representation, but as painter burghers to art-loving burghers. This level playing field appeals to us, but it also humbles us because in the 17th century in Holland, great painting uh, became an intense passion, even a cultural obsession across the whole social spectrum. There are as many experts on Dutch painting, there are many experts on Dutch painting here in this room today, but imagine a whole city full of experts boasting distinct schools of paintings, each with its own special look and each championed by their town like a home team. Historians have made great strides towards understanding this remarkable cultural flower flowering. They have sharpened our appreciation of the meanings, methods, and materials of Dutch painting. They've motivated new historical contexts in which such painting makes sense, including the links of the visual arts to science and commerce of the time. And they have sharpened our understanding of lesser known masters, reconstructing their careers and career strategies. Professor Slaughter is a wonderful guide to a new understanding of Dutch art. I won't go through all his teaching positions, his honors and publications, his books on Rembrandt, on classical mythology and Dutch painting, on the seductions of sight and the seductive art of, the, of, of Holland, and on the so-called fine painters from Gerrit Dow uh, to Franz von Meris. Uh, suffice to say, Professor Slaughter is, has a remarkable range of perspectives from close readings of individual paintings through new assessments of familiar masters 
to wide-angle views of the entire Dutch paintings industry. Our adventure began last week with a fascinating portrait of the Dutch painter's craft as encompassing a huge price and quality spectrum from costly and celebrated works of Rembrandt to canvases and panels that cost less than a hundredth of his works. And yet, uh, as, this, uh, as a wonderful insight, they are still uh, deeply engaging, especially with Professor Eric von Slauter as our guide. Today, he'll turn to a very different phenomenon, not the broad spectrum, but a narrow and rarefied group of painters making jewel-like pictures in close dialogue and competition with one another. Vermeer is the most beloved and famous of the group, but I'm sure uh, in Professor Slaughter's hands we will learn to appreciate his rivals and perhaps therefore be more discerning in our loves. Uh, he, Professor Slaughter will speak to us on artistic competition and creative imitation, Gerard Teborg, Franz von Miris, Jan Stein, Gerrit Dau, Gabriel Metzu, and Johannes Vermeer. Please join me in welcoming Professor Eric Jan Slauter. Well, thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. I'm almost a bit embarrassed to uh, get such an introduction from someone who I've always so much admired. <laughs> um, and again, I would like to thank you all for this great honor uh, to be invited as the this year's Erasmus lecturer at Harvard University and the Harvard Art Museums. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful to be able to teach and to stand here also to give these lectures. Some of you, um, perhaps many of you, uh, have uh, seen this gorgeous exhibition only one and a half year ago titled Vermeer and the Masters of Dutch Genre Painting at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. The concept of this exhibition was drawn up by Adrian Weiboer, <coughs> a former pupil of mine and of Haaf Egbert Haafkamp Begeman, and he's now head of collections and research of the National Gallery of, Ar uh, of Ireland. So that's why the exhibition was also in Dublin. I had the opportunity to contribute with an essay on emulative imitation among the painters who played the leading parts in this exhibition. Gerard Ter Borg, Gerrit Dau, Frans van Mieris, Gabriel Betsu, Jan Steen, and Johannes Vermeer. The paintings you see here um, are an arbitrary choice of the paintings present at the exhibition. And this is the subject that I want to talk about today. Some responses to this exhibition made me think again about uh, the subject. I think that we have never enough realized that since the middle of the 17th century, genre painting, that's what we call it, the depiction of figures in contemporary scenes, especially what we may call high life genre, had become the field of the most talented and most ambitious painters of that time. So during the short period, the third quarter of the 17th century, the most aspiring artists working in the cities of Holland did not, like the earlier generation, become history painters, though some of them, like Vermeer, still began their career as history painters, but they turned to depicting high life genre paintings. And this resulted in some of the greatest paintings ever made. Such breathtaking quality was attained because these painter, paintings originated in an ample atmosphere of rivalry between a small group of highly talented artists, sustained by a circle of knowledgeable collectors who knew how to recognize and how to appreciate such exceptional quality and who must have competed in buying these, the best paintings. 
Remarkably, the paintings from this small group continually repeated the same subjects and the same motifs. Why did they do that? Why, for example, all these standing men bending over towards seated women, pouring wine, offering oysters, or doing some other flirtations thing? Why time and again elegant young women receiving or reading letters? Or all these women writing letters? Or young beauties seated or standing before mirrors? Or all these women playing keyboard instruments? Why do we see so often that when one painting, painter picks up a certain theme or motif, several of their peers will follow very soon and make their own variations? To gain insight into this phenomenon, I have to say something about contemporary notions about creative imitation and its relation to the interaction between artists and connoisseurs. As I said, the artists discussed here were ambitious and made quite expensive to very expensive paintings. They were certainly not the type of painters who could do no better than borrow ideas and motifs from others. These painters obviously knew each other's work well and seemed to have, uh, have competed with great zeal by way of consciously referring to one another, thus pointedly challenging a small group of connoisseurs in the know to compare their works, even if they lived in different cities in Holland. The proximity of the cities and the easy means of public transportation between the cities by towing barge which was the first system of reliable public transportation in the world, with fixed times of departure and arrival, for example, every hour in a barge went from Amsterdam to Haarlem and the other way around, that all stimulated the exchange of ideas and knowledge by face-to-face -face relations, which were so important for enhancing competition and quality. It's fascinating to realize that it must have been a very common practice to visit painters' workshops and uh, the homes of collectors. This is obvious from the fact that in the very few diaries from connoisseurs that we know, we hear about this practice. For example, in 1663, the French nobleman and connoisseur Balthasar de Montconi hops from one city to the other, visiting artists and collectors. The one day he is in Delft to visit Vermeer, hears that Vermeer has no painting in his workshop and is sent to a baker, and then is scandalized by the high price, 600 guilders, for a painting by Vermeer that shows only one figure. He thought it not worth more than 60 guilders instead of 600. The next day he is in Leiden, and, as, and is as appalled about the price of only one woman in a window by Gerrit Dau, of the same price, also 600. Naturally, he must have been comparing in his mind's eye the two small and costly paintings of a single figure of which he could not believe the price. In Leiden, de Monconi also visited that uh, same day Frans van Mieris, where he saw a doctor's scene for which even 1,200 guilders was asked. And he went to Peter van Slingeland and saw there a small painting for 400 guilders. Again, the, he would have doubted, undoubtedly have been comparing their works. On that same day, he also goes to the collection of Johan de Bie, who was not at home. But the maid let him in, which makes clear that one made such visits without making an appointment beforehand. As I said, the paintings we are talking about were very expensive. And I remind you again, as I told last week, that the average income of a, a furniture maker, a skilled craftsman, was 500 guilders a year. The fact that since the beginning of the century, the prices of paintings by living artists had come to di diverge immensely, and that one could buy paintings of about 10 guilders that were still uh, competently painted, to hundreds or even more than a thousand guilders for the works of celebrated artists like Dow and Vermeeris, that makes clear how important discriminating quality had become. 
This means a lot of comparing was going on and that there must have been much discussion about the special qualities of, of the one or the other artist. When visiting artists and collections, comparing quality and prices would have been the basic asset of a connoisseur and it must have given them great pleasure. I'm convinced that these top genre painters were keeping a sharp eye on each other, paying close attention to what others were doing and responding quickly if they saw types, motifs, subjects or compositions they found interesting to do something with in their own work. They must have, find, uh, they must have formed a kind of interurban elite among painters, consciously seeing themselves as artistic rivals. As for this to be, be and for this to be possible, there needed to be a group of dealers and wealthy and discerning connoisseurs who knew how to appreci appreciate this. But what did this rivalry mean? How did one compete? What had the creative imitation to do with it? This, does this imply that one may compete by borrowing ideas, figures, and compositions? That's not a simple question because the art literature of that time is vague about such concepts. All authors about writing about art, such as Kyle van Mander in 1604, Philips Angel in 1642, Samuel van Hoogstraten in 1678, and Houbraken in 1718, they all make clear that borrowing motifs, figures, objects is, uh, from each other is fine during the le learning process because one has to learn through copying good examples, and then one should learn to combine all kinds of borrowed materials to make something different and new out of it. But that was the learning process. As a practice of established painters, it's made clear that in, in this art literature, that this borrowing and combining borrowed motifs was only allowed if one did it in such a way that no one would be able to detect or recognize such borrowings. One had to merge all this material unrecognizably in one's own work. Otherwise, it would be simply stealing. And this would make one the target for ridicule, it said. Only van Hoogstraten seems to allow recognizable borrowings if one admires the arrangement of figures in space in another artist's work, for example, but with the condition that one makes, as he calls it, a new song on the same tune, which implies that one should turn it into a different subject. And a great example of this is, of course, Rembrandt's Blinding of Samson, about which I will speak next week. These authors never write explicitly about striving to surpass other, uh, other, uh, others by imitating the same subjects and motifs, which is, in fact, something that we do see so often. So they write a lot about the need for artistic rivalry as a way to raise the level of art, and especially von Hoogstraten does so, and here I have some quotations from von Hoogstraten. Um, and they write a lot about the problem of what was and what was not permitted when one borrowed from others. But artistic rivalry as, uh, on the basis of recognizably borrowing through emulative imitation, that is not discussed in this literature. Only a few anecdotes we hear in a few anecdotes we hear sometimes about recognizably mating, making use of subjects and compositions from others. And then it appears to be something that only the greatest artists are allowed to do. Van Hoogstraten tells, for example, the anecdote about Rubens, who else? Uh, who was accused of stealing figures and motifs straight from the art of antiquity or from Italian masters. And would have mockingly res responded to this accusation of stealing by saying, well, Everyone is free to do the same if they see any advantage in it. And Van Hoogstraat added, thereby suggesting that not everyone was capable of benefiting from imitation. <coughs> so this, that it is considered something for the best artist only is, however, precisely what Franciscus Junius writes when discussing imitation in the Dutch edition of the, bo uh, the book he originally wrote in Latin, Painting of the Ancients, the Schilderkunst der Ouden of 1641. 
Junius was not an artist like the other authors I just mentioned, but a very learned philologist. This book was basically an assemblage of text fragments from classical antiquity about painting, but Junius also included numerous quotations about rules of rhetoric and poetics also from antiquity, which he thought applicable to the art of painting. But what makes the Dutch edition, uh, the Dutch translation from this Latin text exceptional, and Junius translated it himself, he, Dutch was his mother tongue, is that we find there many digressions making this Dutch edition and this Dutch version 60% longer than the Latin one and also much longer than the English translation, which he also made. Digressions which are grounded and often reflections of conversations about painting in circles of collectors and connoisseurs. And that is so special about the English edition, the Dutch edition. Junius was secretary of one of the great collectors of that time, Lord Arundel. Moreover, he had many relations in Amsterdam and among the intellectual, intellectual elite in Amsterdam, knew artists like Van Dyck and Rubens personally, and was also a friend of the uh, engraver Robert van Voorst, who worked like Junius also in the service of Arundel and who was involved in the publishing processes of the Dutch a uh, translation of Eunice's book. Van Voorst was also the step-uncle of Gerard ter Borg, who stayed as a young and impressionable artist, much younger than he is there, of course, in Van Voorst's London studio, precisely at the time that Junius worked on the Dutch translation in 1635-1636. The young Terborg undoubtedly absorbed every word of the conversations between learned connoisseurs and practicing artists in Arundel's circle. So we should pay attention to what Junius has to say, the more so because he's the only one who makes clear statements about matters of imitation and emulation. Junius too first warns that the, warns that the work of a good master should not have too much similarity to that of other renowned masters. But then he adds that if a work does have a certain similarity, because one admires things in another artist's work, this should not be by coincidence, but entirely intended. For, and I quote, no, sorry. Um, for, in my opinion, the artists who surpass all others are those who diligently pursue the old art with a new argument, thus adroitly bestowing the paintings with the pleasurable enjoyment of dissimilar similarity. Ongelijke gelijkheid. This privilege is obviously reserved for good artists who may measure themselves against other renowned masters by way of conscious similarities, but making it dissimilar through applying a new argument. Thus, he makes clear that this is something that connoisseurs enjoy, scrutinizing and discussing works by truly talented painters showing this dissimilar similarity. Nevertheless, this also implies the risk that art lovers might be critical of artists who did not find the right balance between similarity and dissimilarity, which is, of course, a narrow and objective line, a subjective line. When the artist's adroitness is not considered sufficient and this new argument is not convincing, he is just welding borrowed bits and pieces, and thus second rate, as Junius underlines also. But Junius had been talking about history painting. For true crea creative imitation, there needed to be a canon with standards of high achievement and quality against which new developments could be measured. Such standards had been created in history painting by Italian and Northern masters in the course of the 16th century and the early 17th century. So that a history painter, an artist like Rembrandt, surrounded by knowledgeable and co uh, knowledgeable con connoisseurs in Leiden, The Hague, and Amsterdam, consciously competed through creative imitation, applying his superior knowledge of the tradition of his profession, and thus inserting himself within the company of great predecessors. 
But such standards did not yet exist in the rather new category of genre painting, depicting contemporary life. In the late 1640s and early 1650s, when Dao and Terborg moved into new directions, there was not yet a canon with standards of perfection in this field. Though many motifs were to be found in paintings from the first half of the 17th century's merry companies from such painters as Dirk Hals, Peter Kodde, or Jan Mietse Molenaar, these had not become benchmarks of excellence and value. But such paintings, as well as prints from the late 16th and early 17th centuries, such as series of the senses, the seasons, the elements, the virtues, and the vices, were extremely rich sources uh, for all kinds of motifs that Dao and Terborg could use to forge their own type of paintings. All the themes they chose were already part of pictorial traditions of the 16th and the early 17th century. Entirely new subjects are extremely rare. Dao and Terborg had realized that with their talent, their first-rate training and technical prowess, they could create figure paintings that should be appreciated as being as worthy of the attention of high-class connoisseurs as history paintings. After all, these were also works that depicted interacting human figures for which one had to be proficient in all the parts of painting, as theorists had urged painters to be. Carefully choosing and transforming motifs from the older traditions, Dao and Terborg developed new types in the late 1640s and early 1650s that were preeminently suited for, to show, for showing off highly refined and detailed painting techniques. Thus, they managed to shape new standards of highly desirable collector's items in a different field than history painting. From that time onwards, a younger generation of ambitious genre painters could measure themselves with this new canon of masters, Dao and Terborg in particular, who were highly admired by, highly admired by collectors. The works of painters discussed here testify that such creative dissimilar similarity is what they were striving for. And that and the new argument. Uh, to create this dissimilarity could pre be present in many different aspects of their paintings. In the beauty and grace of the figures, the proportions, the lifelikeness of poses and movements, the liveliness with which the emotions are expressed, the ingeniousness with which the narrative is constructed, including the wit in the response to other artists, the arrangements of figures, the suggestion of space through light and shadow, colors and perspective, and most important, the different manner of painting, not just the handling of the brush, but the different painting techniques with which illusion is created with paint on a flat surface. And about this, Melanie Gifford and Lisha Glinsman have written fabulously analyzing those different painting techniques with which tapestries, fur, or silk were created. And it was up to the connoisseur to compare all this, which uh, what he had seen, recalling in his mind's eye uh, other paintings or having other paintings at hand in the collection he or she was viewing. I will give an example of such, fascinating chain, of such a fascinating chain of creative imitation of dissimilar similarity. Around or shortly after 1650, Gerard de Borg made a painting of a full-length young woman standing before a toilet table with a mirror, doing something with her décolleté while a mate with a silver pitcher and basin seems to be peeking around her back to see her mistress's image in the mirror. It was, as far as we know, the first time that Terborg made a great show of rendering a breathtaking depicted satin skirt. It's also the first time that he placed a young woman in this incredibly stylized pose, pelvis pushed forward, back leaning backwards, and neck bending forward. This pose derives from many late uh, mannerist prints. 
It seems that Sitterborg, having engraving in, engravings in mind of Hendrik Holtzius, representing pride and the sense of sight, that he wittily turned these women, in Holtzius inventions with mirrors in their hand, into profile, ran, into profile rendering uh, this woman as a contemporary young lady. It is also the first time that Terborg depicted luxurious pieces of furniture in his paintings. The monumental bed with dark red velvet, the velvet covered chair in the foreground, and the table with round silver boxes and brush, brush and of course the, the silver pitcher and basin. In the following years, Terborg would, uh, would often repeat the shimmering satin skirt, the stylized pose, the type of lighting and scale of the figure in a painting of standing forward, all um, things that became kind of hallmarks of his style. Thus, he had hit on a type that would become a resounding success. As appears from the many similar paintings he would make and the response among other painters um, uh, that would come. And it's not necessarily this painting, but also similar ones he, that triggered this success. With great ingenuity, Ter Borg had engaged well-known pictorial and iconographical traditions. The woman with a, with a mirror, already used by Hieronymus Bosch for the figure of pride, for example, became familiar through many 16th and early 17th century prints of Fesus and Price, Fesus had a sense of sight and pride, and of Vanitas, for example, and had been picked up as a theme in the first decade, uh, de in decade of the 17th century in paintings by such different artists as Paulus Morelse and Jan Mies Molenaar, who both emphasized the Vanitas context. Canonical paintings by, uh, like Rubens's Venus before a mirror, uh, of which many copies must have existed, and still exist, uh, would also have been part of Ter Borg's baggage, as is evident from another painting he made around the same time. Here he wittily turned, in the first place, Bernardo Strozzi's Vanitas, Vanitas, a painting that was at that time in a famous collection in Amsterdam and well known among Amsterdam connoisseurs into a fashionable, beautifully dressed young woman. But by turning her more with her back towards the viewer and changing the woman holding the mirror in a boy, a contemporary Cupid, he wittily showed that he also knew Rubens's famous composition. Most striking is that Terborg brought back grace into the depiction of contemporary figures, most conspicuously in this early painting uh, owned by the Metropolitan Museum. Because more, during more than a generation, grace, which was a central tenet in Renaissance thinking and art theory, had, consciously, had been consciously jettisoned by, the most, by most Dutch artists in favor of an uncompromising naturalness. But by this time, uh, the tide began to change. The canonical model to turn to for a Dutchman was obviously Holtzius. We have seen that already. Um, and we know that Father Terborg, Father of Gerer, sorry, also an artist, had his children learn drawing by copying prints after Holtzius. So these prints were very familiar to Gerard. The figure of pride, you see that here, is even dressed in a heavy satin uh, 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 dress falling in similar stiff folds. It would not have been Terborg's goal that a viewer would recognize specific references here, I think. What he did, as Angel had advised, was, and I quote, merging the borrowings in sweetly flowing way into his own invention so that they cannot be perceived. In the Rijksmuseum painting of the woman seated before a mirror, on the other hand, he is using the method of explicitly, uh, explicitly asking, asking for comparison, recognizably referring to the models of some of his greatest artists of Europe. 
He presents this as a dissimilarity with a radically new argument, which should be admired and discussed for its wit and, it, uh, and its naturalness. It took several years during which, during which Ter Borg made a few other paintings with young women dressed with spectacular satin skirts and as the focus of attention before responses by others came. But then the contest had set in. Ter Borg's innovations were seized upon by Frans van Mieris, Jan Steen, Gabriel Metsu, and Johannes Vermeer. A prime example that in turn would have a great effect on other paintings was Frans van Mieris' duet, dated 1658. Van Mieris received his education from Gerrit Dau, the other renowned painter of modern life from an older generation, who of the same generation as Ter Borg had acquired great fame with small panels painted with incredible refinement and precision. He depicted initially quite modest people, often made servants, and developed this arch window motif um, of natural stone as a kind of recognizable hallmark of his art. Being an ambitious young painter, Frans van Mieres thought ways to distinguish his work from his master, while simultaneously demonstrating his roots as a pupil in the highly admired, uh, uh, of the highly admired Dao. It was precisely Ter Borg's gracefulness uh, of a richly dressed young lady um, that, that he pounced upon. He recognized the reference to Goltzius, and brought the proportions of his young lady even closer to Goltzius' women by lengthening the figure and making her neck even longer. Vermeerus strove to surpass the exceptional refinement of his master Gerrit Dau by making his brush strokes entirely invisible and by adding this very lively, uh, miraculous play of seemingly moving light on all surfaces. And with this breathtaking technique, he took up the competition with Ter Borg, recognizably referring to two of the latter painters, not only this one, but also with, uh, to a more recent work of music-making women and the page. Within the arrangement of the figures of the latter painting, the page coming in with a tray, while the lute-playing man, uh, uh, lute-playing woman becomes a young man, Van Mieres inserted this standing woman with her, ex uh, with her exaggerated uh, Terborgian elegance, together with the obliquely placed chair covered in velvet in the foreground to define her place in space. Vermeer has also emphasized the sinuousness of the woman's figure, but not like Ter Borg by situating the light lit figure with slight, sharply defined contours against the, dark, against the darkish background, but by placing her against the light, a radically geometrical background dominated by straight lines, straight verticals. In a critique on the exhibition, uh, a quite authoritative Dutch art historian wrote that he did not believe that Van Meer's work had anything to do with the two Terborg paintings, which I find truly amazing. We should realize that it cannot be a coincidence that Van Meer's also painted a similar page entering a room from the right with a glass of lemonade on a tray in a scene of a music-making duo. No other, painter prying, no other painting prior to these two works by Ter Borg and Vermeerus is known that includes the same motif. To assume that Vermeerus, who tried uh, here for the first time his hand at such an elegant scene of elite leisure, would have come up with the same idea independently from Ter Borg seems to me absurd. Vermeers could have added a third person in the background in countless different ways, but he chose to do it in a clear dialogue with Ter Borg. And not only the woman in Vermeers' uh, duet, but also the velvet upholstered chair in the right foreground obviously demonstrates the, arch, uh, the artist's thorough knowledge of Ter Borg's young, young woman at her toilet with a maid. Or should we imagine that by accident both artists had such a chair positioned obliquely in their studio when they were drawing after the model? 
The woman herself, about whom the same reviewer wrote that he fails to see uh, uh, what they have in common and thinks that virtually everything is different, was without any doubt Van Meers' direct response to Ter Borg, as is obviously from her posture, her dress and the position in relation to the chair and the secondary figure. At this moment in time, 6058, not only had Vermeers never before painted such a graceful, richly dressed ladies, but also new in the oeuvre was the Terborgian subject of brilliantly rendered satin clad women as the alluring focus of a wealthy, inter wealthy interior. Such art historian still seems to be thinking in terms of influence, which makes them blind for conscious choices that artists make in dialogue with one another. This motif of a young woman at a keyboard instrument with, a, with or without accompaniment, accompaniment of a young man on the lute can also be traced back to other examples that we know from prints of the early 17th century. For example, the couple in Goltzius's Invention of the Sense of Hearing from a series of the senses and another couple in his uh, Children of Venus from a series of the Children of the Planets. Um, uh, as well as in a wonderful, for and this is another example, the same, there are more examples, wonderful, well-known songbook of 1602. So these were the earlier examples with, on which he tuned in. It was this painting that sparked off a whole series of beautiful images of women at keyboard instruments. Frans Vermeer's friend Jan Steen responded immediately in a painting dated a year later, 1659. Steen knew, of course, that he would never match Vermeer's technique. He also knew that he could only compete with Vermeer's by emphasizing his own strengths, turning the scene into a comedy through humorous wit. Steen harked back, uh, harked back to the more traditional seated woman at the harpsichord, uh, and like Vermeer's, he knew Ter Borch's painting with music-making women, which, obvious from, uh, this, which is obvious from this timid version of Ter Borch's, Ter Borch's singing woman. Stein also returned to, the emphatic, to an emphatical naturalness of prose, making Vermeer's lady look over-sophisticated and artificial. The page now brings in a huge tiorbo uh, with, with which the man has to prove himself. Acta, yeah, there's the tiorbo. Acta virum probant. Uh, it says on the lid of the harpsichord. Um, <clears throat> deeds prove the man. It remains to be seen whether this man will succeed in winning the heart of this shy girl by playing in harmony with her. She seems to be unaware of the play of, yet, of love as yet. For her, the making of music is solely Deo Gloria. Apart from the admiring beauty of the painting and the lively and moving depiction of expression, the viewer will admire Stein's great wit. Gabriel Metsu picked up the theme of the woman at the keyboard, instru keyboard instrument shortly after in several paintings. Metsu demonstrated that nobody could match him in the combination of a highly sophisticated but a more loose and flowing painting technique and that nobody could match him in a lively narrative and especially an animated but subtle expression of moods and effects. His earliest painting, with a woman at the virginal, uh, accompanied by a singing young man, is a good example. Here, Metsu uses the theme of the duet, but referred more di directly than Vermeer's to Terborg singing woman in the music-making uh, uh, music women, in particular by placing the woman in a very strong light against the rather undefined dark background, so that her contours are clearly delineated and the white satin reflects a brilliant light. Simultaneously, he gives, he gives the space an entirely different character by showing the light source, 
a window at the left for in the left foreground, which explains, as it were, the half shadow in which the man is situated. Metzger was certainly acquainted with Stain's painting as well. Um, but activated both the young woman and the hopeful lover who is now trying to prove himself by singing his part, beating time and swinging his, uh, in a broad gesture with his hat, uh, of which the flashy feathers repeat the colors of the woman's dress. In another painting of a few years later, Metsu included the motif of the lover offering a glass of wine that was also becoming popular because uh, from Taborg started that. But Metsu inserted a variation of another Taborgian figure, the striking man offering a message in the Taborg's refused letter. In the girl seated at a virginal, Metsu incorporated Tabor's slightly recoiling pose of the woman refusing the latter. Now the girl at the virginal sort of coyly turns towards this somewhat pushy lover whose intentions are obviously not trusted by the little dog at the left. With his woman at the clavichord of circa 1663, Gerrit Dau responded to, this, to his much younger colleagues, Jan Steen and Frans van Mieres. And it was only around this time, that, so rather late in Dau's career, that he also started experimenting with Terborgian themes of wealthy young ladies dressed in satin. He inserted her in a format that was his hallmark. Figures and objects are placed on the border of a strong beam of light from a large window at the left, flowing diagonally through this space towards the foreground, which leaves a large part of the interior in the dark. The viewer's entrance to this space is defined by a stone arch, um, uh, and so that the admiring viewer, the lover, as it were, of this young woman can enter this wondrous world of the fine painter. A world before which a heavy tapestry hanging in this stone arch had been pulled away to reveal its beauty. The viewer is invited to play on the cello a virtual duet with this young woman. Dow makes the girl at the clavicle uh, court address the viewer directly so that the inf invitation uh, becomes very direct as he had often done with his attractive maidservants. This woman at the clavichord is not only uh, is the is the only painting discussed here of which we can be quite certain where it was hanging in the it was hanging in a collection of 27 paintings by Dow owned by burgomaster Johan de Bee in Leiden who and it, this was a collection that could be visited by anyone interested as we know from an advertisement in the Haarlemmer Courant and also from the visit of Balthasar de, Cuny, de Montcony whom I just mentioned and who went there and where the maid let him in. <coughs> Cosper Natcher's young lady accompanying a singing young man would have been recognized by connoisseurs for whom such painting was made as an updating of Vermeer's duet. It even includes the page bringing in the drinks on the tray. Simultaneously, Natcher demonstrated that he, ha that he had been trained uh, by, uh, in the studio of the famous Terborg. He turned from Vermeeres' graceful young woman into a figure that comes straight from Terborg's gallant conversation of circa 1655. Oh, and I have already pushed too hard, I think. Um, Um, but uh, as you see, um, uh, he uh, al elongated the figure, uh, that figure uh, a bit, and Natcher used the composition of the Borg painters, painting also um, uh, as a sort of template, you could say, um, 
by this was painting was made by the way at the moment that he was in Tabor studio uh, so he knew it very well uh, and he changed the seated woman uh, into a lavishly dressed singing young man also moving the man in Tabor's painting with the tilted head to the right at the stand to the right of the standing woman transforming her him into a young woman Nature also depicted huge Corinthian columns, as you see, between which a sculpture and large paintings are visible, thus upgrading the ambience into a palatial gallery. Now one wonders whether the connoisseur might have judged the different, part, the, the different parts as too recognizably borrowed and not even enough transformed to something new. It seems to me that this painting comes dangerously close to what Junius had scornfully rejected as welding together bits and pieces from others. A painting by Jan Steen, probably made shortly after, responds humorously to Natchez's painting, also referring to the original source from Mieres' duet that Steen had used before. But he included Natcher's young man seated on our side of the keyboard instrument, turning him to, into a foppishly dressed greenhorn, looking up longingly to the young lady. Her proportions are exaggeratedly stylized like Natcher's lady. However, he inserted the narrative he used before, but heightening the comedy. Now a boy is reaching for a lute hanging on the wall, high up on the wall, to bring it to this transported young dandy who has to prove he can harmonize with her. He probably is boldened by the wine he is drinking, but trouble is approaching in the form of a dignified man in black uh, who is coming in. Is he your father or is he your husband? And the only and only the laughing boy looking out at us who makes us an accomplice, huh? because we also see the man coming in, uh, seems to realize that the, what is coming. Stain made Natchez's improbable palace gallery into a well-to-do home again, stuffing the space with many active figures, animals and objects and adding the perspective view containing part of his lively narrative. Thus, Stain, though employing the same elements as Natcher, seems to make fun of Natcher's pretensions. Johannes Vermeer's two later paintings of women at the Virginal refer quite obviously to Vermeer's duet for, uh, for this standing woman and Dow's woman at the clavichord for his woman seated at the Virginal. In these late works, Vermeer gives the striking effect of reflecting light of the surface of satin here his full attention. He must have known well the paintings by Vermeer's and Dow. Dow's painting was easily accessible, as we have seen. It was in this co collection of Jan de B. And Vermeer's work must have been within easy reach of artists and connoisseurs as well, considering the many responses to this composition. Abandoning the effect of aloofness that many of his women in earlier works characterize, Vermeer now even enhanced the direct confrontation of the young woman, inviting the viewer to participate. So characteristic of many paintings of Dao. By Dao. In the painting with the standing woman, whose upright attitude and proportion seems like a comment on Vermeer's over-stylized elegance, Vermeer ingeniously inserted the old motif of Venus and Cupid. He updated that theme by transforming this couple in an earthly Venus with a painting of Cupid hanging behind her, emphasizing two pairs of eyes that address the viewer. It recalls a composition such as Werner, Werner van der Valkert's Venus and Cupid. Though the viewer is not going to be hit by Cupid, Cupid's arrow, as in Van der Valkert's painting, where he's st going stra aiming straight at the viewer, the beholder, whose name might be inscribed on the little card Cupid is holding up, is certainly invited to fall in love with the woman. Vermeer plays with the illusion that one pair of eyes observing us belongs to a figure that the viewer perceives as a living person, the woman, whereas the eyes of Cupid are perceived as belonging to a painted figure. Oh, but both, of course, are as much paint on canvas. 
But art lovers um, are not only invited to fall in love with these two beautiful women, he is especially challenged to compare uh, them, uh, with works by Van Mieris and Dow and see the huge difference in the technique of rendering illusion. In The Standing Woman, it's expected spectacular sheen of skirt and sleeve and the soft luster, it will come back, of the chair's blue velvet to be compared with Vermeer's. In The Seated Woman, it is, for example, the heavy wooliness of the colorful tapestry or the polish of the viola's wood and the glossy satin of the dresses. More radically than before, Vermeer displaced the contrast of his, of his manner with the descriptive finesse of the two Leiden painters. In great contrast to this, his Leiden peers, Vermeer refuses to allow a leading role for a descriptive imitation of different textures of the materials. His way of depicting the effect of reflected light by solid planes of different gradations of light and shade placed next to each other uh, cannot be more different from the uncanny modulation of color and tone in Van Mieris's imitation of silk, in which no brushstroke can be detected. In both Van Mieris and Dow's paintings of the seated woman, the blue satin of a costume seems to be of a somewhat thinner silk than in the other paintings, falling in smaller pleats. Though this extremely, uh, through this extremely fine technique of painting with tiny short lines, hey, in Dow's painting, tiny short lines with remarkable nimbleness, nimbleness applied, Dow manages to suggest the ev uh, even the warps and, weft, warps and weft of the material, um, which you can't see well in this slide, but which you can see, really see in the painting, even with a magnifying glass. And I think connoisseurs used a magnifying glass for such a painting. Vermeer comments on this by making the flatness and angularity of his planes of color even more conspicuous. And as eye-catching is the contrast between the two manners with which the heavy tapestries with their decor of leaves, fruits, and uh, geometrical ornament is pa are painted. Dow's virtuoso description of the material's texture uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, Vermeer's suggestion of the optical effect of light on the material, painted with a virtuosity that is as striking. The same art historian who criticized the catalog and exhibition wrote that to his mind, and I quote, the way in which artistic rivalry was defined in this exhibition also makes the originality of a contribution like Vermeer's very hard to understand, end quote. It seems that he felt that the theme of the exhibition undermined or called into question the originality of the artists. Taking a modern, no modern no notion of originality for granted, he appears unwilling to accept that among this specific group of highly ambitious painters, 17th century concepts of innovation, invention, and originality were frequently played out through emulative imitation. I am convinced that, on the contrary, comparing Vermeer's work to the paintings with similar themes and motifs by his peers, offers us an unsurpassed opportunity to clarify the originality of Vermeer's contribution and to give it all, and to give it all the more relief. What I've shown here, and uh, many other examples can be given, testifies that the artists were very much aware of what the others were doing. New motifs and compositions spread rapidly, which implies that there was a select group of connoisseurs and art dealers who owned or sold such paintings and were visited frequently by artists and connoisseurs alike. The painters responded self-consciously to the other's work and each of them demonstrated what could be done with the same motifs. 
Simultaneously, each of them was very keen in displaying his own characteristics in figure types, manner of painting, ways of suggesting space, and so on, creating a dissimilarity, uh, similar similarity, and challenging comparison, but also seeing to it that their works were recognizable as being a Terborg, a Dau, a Vermeerus, a Steen, a Metsu, or a Vermeer. Connoisseurs could point out the characteristics, the, the characteristics and differences in work of, works of this group of highly talented painters who competed with each other through wit and technique. This con these connoisseurs constituted the critical basis that made this immensely high quality possible. Such exceptional quality can only come into being in, situa in a situation of rivalry. For this to work, however, one needed a highly sophisticated audience that could appreciate this rivalry and was able to value such quality and was willing to pay for it. Thank you. <laughs>